When he rose up from the grave It's only because he lives. <laughs> I can face tomorrow because he lives. I'm telling you, every bit of fear, it's gone. Because I know
good Christians in this morning. Please stand up with me and turn to your neighbours in the pews and say, Christ is risen. And if you're welcome like this, respond and say, he is risen indeed. Yes, Christ is indeed is risen from the grave on this fateful Sunday. Good morning, Sangate Uniting Church, wherever you may be as we gather on this most incredible of mornings. We follow Jesus as he walked the Via Dolorosa on Friday, where he was cruelly crucified on Calvary. His death was like no other, as it was one that was testified by the predictions of the prophets. They had wrote down hundreds of years before that Messiah was a man marked for death. He would hang on the tree. But in their grand prophecies, there was the promise that was given that the Messiah would conquer the world and defeat death itself. Posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord and proclaim his deliverance to the people yet unborn, saying that he has done it. Let us continue in praise of Jesus' holiness and great love for us in all, in his death and resurrection. In our next song. Please stand.
Our psalm reading this morning comes from Psalm 118, verses 19 to 20. Open me to the gates of righteousness, that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord, the righteous shall enter through it. Now let us stand and sing our next song. now moving to our announcements um, there'll be no Sunday evening service this Sunday and uh, also uh, conversations is going to be on hold until Monday the 15th of April uh, we'll be resuming at its normal time at 10 a.m. in the church where after the other uh, on the 15th now the powerhouse prayer meeting will be held at 6 30 p.m. on the Wednesday so please do come along to that and also uh, um, if we, I'm not sure whether we've got to have it this, we'll have practice this Thursday or not, but uh, we've got the practice for the musicians and, the, and the, the singers on 4 p.m. on Thursday when the musicians are available. Um, there'll also be a jam making workshop at 9 a.m. Uh, on the 13th of April. Um, they'll be there to make chutneys and pickles, mostly for the actual Christmas lights that we'll be turning up in them. But uh, it's a bit of inf inf a bit useful information to work with if you want to preserve some stuff as well. Um, also, there'll be the psychological first aid training course to be held by Sandbank at Fitzgibbon Community Hall on the 19th of April uh, from 9 a.m. to noon. RSVP with Sandbag so they can cater for you. Uh, for further information, please do contact Graham Mitchell. I think he's over there in the pews as we speak. And uh, we must not forget Donut Day on the 20th of April. Um, we've reset the prices, so it'll be $10 for a dozen and $6 for six. 
Uh, the drive sheets will be on the greeters table if you want to be involved with that. So do bring them in, uh, I think, about a fortnight beforehand. Uh, the Thursday before. So if you get one. The 18th. So do bring it in by the 18th. Uh, also, uh, we want to actually make known that uh, there will be um, some training on for the church council essentials on the 18th of the 2nd of May uh, between 8.30 p.m. and 8.30, 6.30 and 8.30. Uh, it's a hybrid online face-to-face. -face. The venue will be at United Church and will be taken by Reverend Nigel Rogers. This is for our church council members uh, just to help them along and to get trained on the actual practices of church council. So, uh, I think that's all the notices we've got. Uh, Oh yes, um, also our op shop is currently open. Um, I think we'll need more volunteers, so do please, uh, please speak to Rosina if you can, if you can help out. Um, I think it's, uh, when do we actually have, is it uh, Monday through the? Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday? Nine to two. Nine to two, okay, thanks for that. Uh, but now we'll actually move on to our offerings to God, thanks. to you as a token of our submission to you will on earth. Take these humble, uh, uh, take these for the spreading of the gospel for the four corners of the earth. Take these crowns as our King of kings and Lord of lords. Rightful ruler of the earth, conqueror of death and saver of the many. 
Amen. We want to lift up the churches throughout the Middle East and Asia, where being a Christian is very difficult and sometimes comes with the cost of life. Places like Iran, Pakistan, India, China, and in North Korea too. Pray they are able to celebrate the victory in Christ peacefully. We also want to lift up the nations in war right now, Ukraine and Russia, and in so many places in the Middle East. We ask that your peace settle across these lands in turmoil and that may, they may all come to know your name. We also lift up our hands and voices to the farmers across the world as they struggle against bureaucracies in many nations who are aiming to cut food production. Wherever it is in Europe with bureaucratic interference on farms or in America where there are states that are banning people from having small farms altogether. The world needs food security and we ask that your light be spread around to everybody in power, that they see the folly of removing farms and the food that they produce. We pray for the schools, police and other welfare organisations to find better ways to engage young people before they are enticed into a destructive cycle that leads to youth crime. These kids are our future, and we need strong leadership to change the fates of the wayward and their possible victims as well. So Lord, we ask you to be with everybody in the situation, not just the kids, but also the people who, who they target as well. And that peace may settle across all, particularly in this season where, where Christ's new life is bring a renewal to everyone. We also pray for a resolution to the spiralling rent problems of the affordability and availability throughout the southeast of Queensland. People everywhere are crying out for housing. There are so many out in the streets right now. We just don't know how much that they are suffering and how much it actually costs for rental right now. Lord, we ask your hand in finding a way that all may be saved from the streets. We also want to lift up our voices to, to so many in our congregation, people like Venice and Barry, Glennis and John, and Linda as well. We also want to think of Kathy and Jean, Carrie and Deb and Gary, and also Megan, and we mustn't forget Ian and Naomi and Barbara and Karen and, we, and of course June. We want to lift these people up because we know that they're going through a fair bit and illness as well. So Lord, place your, your healing hands upon them if they need healing and rest their troubled souls if they are troubled right now. We also are thinking of Reverend Gary and Deb as they take a small break over these next few weeks. You will be thinking of them as they take this small sabbatical and look forward to their return. But I also want you all to, to take a pause right now to think of someone in your lives who needs a saviour in their lives. Someone who needs to hear the good news of Christ's new life. We ask the Lord to work in their lives to nurture their hearts so that faith may be planted in their lives too. We ask all these things in the name of our wonderful Saviour, the one who came back to life today. May he bring life to them as well and to all the world. Amen. I know that there's the, uh, on the screen, there's the Bible readings, and I'm going to do them in a moment. But I want to ask a question. Who, and the children, you can tell me in a big voice, who had chocolate for breakfast? I had to leave home so early, I went downstairs and went, no time for breakfast, so I grabbed a chocolate bar. 
So I had chocolate for breakfast. And I called in on my children um, to give them an Easter greeting um, this morning. And I said, okay, have we had breakfast? Yeah, we've had chocolate. <laughs> Tradition in our family was the one thing that children could do before we went off to church on Sunday morning was to have one hollow egg to crack it and remind themselves why today is so special. But when we bite into a hollow egg, the chocolate for me is the darkness of that tomb where Jesus' body was laid and when we bite into it, it's the freedom that the tomb is empty and he has risen. And so I just wanted to remind the children this morning and all of us who are young at heart that there is joy in recognising our risen Christ in the bite of a delicious chocolate. The readings this morning are on the screen and they read like this. In their fright, the women bowed down to their faces, with their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the, men, among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Remember, he told you while he was still with you in Galilee. And then in Hebrews it says, We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain where our forerunner, Jesus, has entered on our behalf. And the words of Psalm 16, You make known for me a path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. The joy of Christ is so with us this day. And we're going to hear from two members of our congregation this morning about their faith journey and their walk with Christ. I want to introduce you to, I'm sure everyone knows this name, you may not know that who it is, um, and you might just recognise this lady when you see her and then you'll know her name. And then we have a gentleman going to share with us as well. So firstly, I want to introduce you to Helena Pierce and I then Jeff Litchfield will follow. Thank you. this up. Good morning. Um, this is not my usual thing, so bear with me. Um, oh, back in 1956, we emigrated from, Austra from Holland to Australia. Um, we lived for six months then at Waco and then moved to Zilmere. Now, I don't know when exactly I started at the Zilmere Church of Christ, but I do remember that for all of my youth and everything, that we were very active in the Zulmi Church of Christ. Um, so I have been with the church and everything from very young. Anyway, um, when I got married, of course, things changed. And um, we couldn't find, my husband was Anglican and I was Church of Christ, and we could never find a church that we were comfortable in. We had our faith, but we would go periodically on and off. So that's what I did for 50 years until he passed. But when he was, um, but God was with me all this time. And um, in the last few years, about four years ago, when I had to become full time carer for my husband, and uh, it was um, COVID, so I sort of really just stayed home because we were told that if he got COVID, he wouldn't survive. And um, so I stayed home with him, didn't do much else or anything, go out much, only shopping and that. And um, then the last 12 months, 
of his life. He was, it was full-time care, 24-7. He could not be left alone. Anyway, October 23, he was put in, he had to go into a nursing home. And we lived out at Lawton. So in the October, he got, the only place spot available was Regis down here at Sandgate. So uh, at the same time, our lease had run out on our house and they were not renewing because they wanted to do some renovations, so I had to move. So while I'm getting him settled, I had to find a spot, place, and I found a place at Deegan, a one-bedroom unit, and I moved to Deegan because this is the area I wanted, so I was only five minutes down the road from him. So with that, God got me to Deegan. I went and visited my husband. I used to pray for his release of pain. He was in so much pain. He just got worse that he could not walk. He had to be hoisted and things. And that did not go down well with him. He was a very active man and he just couldn't do anything. Anyway, in the January 23, he got COVID and he survived that bout of COVID. But February, he got COVID a second time and pneumonia. And um, when he come home from that, from hospital, he'd had a lot of falls and had a lot of broken bones. Um, since the October, he had fractured his neck, nose, cracked his ribs, broke his wrist twice. And that, but he was, um, we always had the faith still. And um, so I used to just pray that God would release him from his pain. And um, in February last year, and that, it was merciful that God did release him from his pain and he passed away with his family beside him. But after the service and everything, and everybody going back to work, because the kids were all around me and everything for the few weeks, and I'd just sit there in my unit and think, I need a purpose in my life. And I put it out there and I prayed for a purpose in my life. Because my last three years had just been looking after a husband and he was no longer there. And what do I do? I didn't know what to do anymore. I was a person who loved coffee mornings before COVID. Saw this sign up here every day I drove past to go to Regis. Conversations, coffee morning. So I thought, well, okay, I need to do something. I have to make the move. It won't happen to me unless I go forth and do it. So I went in, come in on the Monday morning to conversations. And I was greeted so warmly by Margaret, Venice, and Marie, bless her soul. And um, I was just made to feel so welcome. So for a few weeks then on a Monday, I would come to conversations and it was really good. Only about half a dozen of us, but it gave, it started my purpose. I tried a couple of other things because I was networking. So I went to a networking group I went to a crystal coffee morning for crystals. Um, they got a bit too heavy for me though, so I backed out of them. Um, they sort of worship different things to what I worship. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so, but this seemed to be like I was coming home. So I come to church, and the first Sunday I come to church, who's the greeter? Venice. So I knew her, arms around me, welcome. Sat with Marie in church. And, that, and I just prayed and thanked God that he drew me here. And um, Gary keeps telling me it was all done for a reason. You know, Rick went to Regis, so I moved to Deegan and that. I come to conversations. My son bought me a unit next door, so I live next door now, and I only have to walk to church. Sometimes that's, that's a blessing, and other times it's not quite a blessing because um, I'm called on a bit more often than what I thought I would be. Um, but then, yes, and I got to know Gary, and um, Gary found out that what I had done, accounts and things. So here I am now, treasurer, fully involved in this church. Um, tell me 12 months ago, and I would have said, no, never. I wouldn't be doing all this. And yet here I am today, and I just thank the Lord for that. And um, I have a real purpose in my life now. I am very involved in this church and um, it is amazing because I've only been coming here what about nine months but I felt like I come home 
their warmth and the welcome from everybody here was just amazing. And I really felt like I have just come home and I'm just fully involved. So, thank you. Where to start? Um, my name is Jeff Litchfield. I've been a member of this congregation for roughly about 11 years now, I think. Almost 11 years. But uh, when I was young, I, my mother actually put us through, I thought my brother and I through Sunday school. But, but we only were there for like a couple of years, but we moved away and into a different area. And but, uh, life takes you in a different direction. And uh, though not uh, a really wild child, I was still far from God. In my actual 30s, I felt like I was in the top of the world. I was uh, an IT professional. I was actually working for an ISP and uh, making pretty good money. But uh, then my world fell apart when my employer got uh, pulled up in front of the, the ACCC. And uh, I could not stand with him at that particular junction in time. And because of that, I was no longer able to work in my profession. And so I had to find work at whatever I could do. And, and I did find it. I, I found myself a factory job. From being a professional down to a factory job. I worked hard. And in that hardness, there was a chance to sweat and to get past the pain and, and to let some things go. But there was that moment, would have been like almost 12 years ago right now. It was a winter's, at the winter's day and it was, I was working alone. Everybody else was up in the actual, uh, the sewing room of this, of this particular factory I was in. And a despair came over me like nothing I'd ever experienced. Completely soul crossing. I was in complete depression. Then something from outside of me touched me. And I knew it was the Lord. He gave me words. And those words filled me with so much hope. But with so many questions too. I had to go find out what that was about. But I know that the Lord himself was, was protecting me from the hardness of that year as well. Because I know in that year, I lost not only an uncle who was not that much older than me, but also lost a girlfriend, an ex-girlfriend, who tragically committed suicide. And I know that if I had not taken that initial path towards Christ, I would not be here. He, he purchased my actual, he purchased me with his words. But they were no, not, they, they were strange words. They were the words of Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane. But it was speaking in my own voice, but not my voice. So I was speaking as Christ, but it wasn't a voice of a turmoil of pain. It became a voice of victory and strength. I didn't know what to make of it. It made me so curious that I had, had to find out what, what it was all about. And I came to church. And it's, I won't say that it has been an easy journey, there have been ups and downs. I've lost jobs and, and found jobs as well. Yeah. And there have been other people who've, who've left and come into my life. But the one thing I can always count on is the love of Christ in my life. And I encourage you all, if Christ reaches out to you to put his hand on your shoulder, to take it to run with it, because it is a good life. It is the best life that you can actually have. And even though I know Christ has got a lot more battles to fight inside of me, because there are times when I feel like an imposter, and I will admit that right now, I, 
There are times when I feel like a real imposter at times. But I'm working through it with Christ. But I know he's here for me. And I know that he has won the victory of life and death. And I can find new life in him. And I know that all of you can find life in him too. God bless. Thank you, Helena. Thank you, Jeff. Isn't it wonderful? You often, are you often out there thinking, nobody knows what I'm going through? Are you sometimes there thinking, where am I going? Well, you've heard two wonderful stories of Christ's victory in life this morning. So I have a couple of questions that I'm going to ask you this morning. What do you do when you feel hopeless? Do you hide away? Do you seek temporary solace in an addictive substance or escapist entertainment? Do you fight to find a solution? Or do you reach out to a trusted friend? The common thread in our stories this morning was both Helena and Jeff reached out to Christ. The Easter story shows us another way to respond to feelings of hopelessness. It finds a path to hope by approaching Jesus. When Jesus died and his body was placed in a tomb, in that dark, dark tomb, and then on the Sunday afterwards, a group of women who had followed him, Mary Magdalene, Mary, Joanna, they walked the path to the tomb where they expected to find Jesus' body. After watching him suffer and die, they were feeling grief-stricken and hopeless. They held a symbol of hopelessness in their hands. These symbols were the spices ready to anoint his body, his dead body. However, although they expected to find his body and simply anoint him with respect, their path of hopelessness turned into a path of hope. Why? Because at the tomb, they didn't find his body. They found an angel who shared that amazing, amazing news, the good news that Jesus had come back to life. Jesus rose from the dead and through this act, he offered hope for the future, the future of all people. It's a hope that is certain, and I believe one we can hold on to. Remember the reading from Hebrews this morning. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. I believe there's a profound lesson, probably lots of lessons, but we're just going to talk about one. In a situation that felt hopeless, the women took the one action they could take. Do you remember the story? They approached Jesus. <coughs> okay, albeit they didn't recognise him and they didn't know it was Jesus at first, but they approached Jesus. Just as Jesus approached God the Father in prayer during his anguish. You might remember that anguish. Jeff spoke about it earlier today in what we watched in the Via Dolorosa, the Good Friday reflection. But the women physically approached Jesus during their anguish. And through this approach, 
They find Jesus. They just don't find Jesus, but they find hope and joy and life. Jesus loves each one of us. And I believe knowing this gives meaning in our lives. This morning we heard from Psalm 16, where it tells us that he promises us joy, a sense of purpose, as Helena reflected, and assures us of the hope of eternity. I hold on to that hope. I speak of it often to people. I have seen that hope for a future on the face of my dying husband. I've seen that hope for eternity in the smile he gave as he left this world. So as we seek hope in our lives, purpose in our lives, I've got a couple of questions I'd like you to ponder. These questions, I want you to have a think about them. We might have them on the screen, Paul, thank you. If you were one of Jesus' followers during his time on earth, how would you react to the news of his death and then resurrection? You might remember the story of the walk to Emmaus and walking with Jesus. Was that your reaction? How does knowing Jesus offer you hope and a purpose make you feel? We heard this morning for Helena, it's joy. And then how can you walk that path of hope this Easter season? Because if indeed Jesus Christ died, was buried and rose again, then it changes everything. I mean, death is defeated. It means that Jesus can do things. As we read in scripture, he even appears and disappears at will. So in that first question, how do you think the apostles reacted to their Lord's resurrection? How did they know it was him? Did they doubt? We know that they did not believe the story conveyed to them by the women who had been at the tomb. I guess I wouldn't have believed it either after seeing someone I loved, respected and watched killed brutally on a cross. These men were distraught, afraid and unsure. Really, it's one thing to raise someone from the dead, and Jesus did that, we know. But raising oneself from the dead? Hang on a minute. A common theme among the Gospels is that the apostles did not understand Jesus' predictions of his own resurrection until after the resurrection. We have the blessed joy of being Easter people, a people born after the first Easter. And yet so many of us struggle to believe. When Jesus appeared to the 10 remaining, remember, remember the story, Thomas wasn't there and Judas has already sadly committed suicide. Jesus simply materialized in front of them, in a locked room, windows and doors closed and locked because they were afraid. He looked different and they thought he was a ghost. But when he spoke to them, they recognized him. Just as Jeff said to us this morning, when he heard that voice, he knew it was Jesus speaking to him. We're told that Jesus appeared again later when Thomas was with them. Thomas, Thomas who refused to believe the testimony of all his friends. 
What did he need? He needed to see and touch those wounds for himself. Is this you? Would this be you? Do you hold with the seeing is believing context? Or do you believe the gift of the written word in our scriptures? When Jesus ate with them, they felt his breath. Clearly demonstrated he wasn't a ghost. He looked a little different. And at first, nobody recognised him. We read several accounts post-death appearances that people didn't recognise Jesus until he speaks with them. So here he is appearing and disappearing at will. How often do we not recognise when Jesus is with us? Once, you know, give the apostles credit where credit's due, once they processed the fact that Jesus was resurrected, they became filled with joy. Imagine seeing someone you love and admired come back from the dead. Right now, I'm not really quite sure how I would feel or react. Have you ever wondered what it might, what you might say if faced with the living Jesus? There's been times in my life when I've been in a meditation and felt sure when I'd open my eyes, I would see Jesus. But what would I say and do? I've still yet to find out. I believe that if the apostles had any doubts at all about Christ's divinity before, it was then that it was erased, when they finally processed that Jesus was alive. So the the apostles went from being fearful and afraid, being in hiding, locked in a room, to bolding, boldly preaching about Christ. So if we went to the next question, I can only answer that question for me. When I know Jesus is with me, which I walk in his footsteps every day, I believe. I feel cared for. I know in my heart that God has a plan for me. I might not know what it is. And, you know, sometimes I don't know much at all. However, what I do know is when I surrender daily to God, he takes care of whatever it is that I need to accomplish. I now have no guilt in my life. I have no fear of death. I will walk a path that Jesus draws for me each and every day until he claims me home. And I believe with all my heart that this is the power of Christ in me. Do you ask Jesus daily to be Lord of your life? The last question says, how can you walk a path of hope this Easter? I believe we live in a times of uncertainty and turmoil around the world. I also believe that Jesus is the only one who offers us a path to hope and a sense of purpose. I would ask that you would seek your own answers to these questions. Talk to a friend. Gather a small group together, perhaps around the family table. And take time to pause over these questions. And maybe, just maybe, you can start when we meet over morning tea today. As we come together. alone, my hope is found, he is my light, my strength.
that I want to say. Let us pray. Dear God, thank you that Jesus rose back to life. Thank you that he gives life meaning. His life gives meaning and purpose to us and that you offer us a hope we can hold on to. Help us to seek strength in your hope and to experience the path that leads to life and joy. Amen. Father God, I ask that you bless all our comings and goings this day. 
be before each one of us, behind us and beside us. Protect us and move us, each one, toward that which will bring us closer to you. Father, Son and Holy Spirit, bless us all with peace today. As we sing our final song. Your God.